the drawings we have of his work in the late 1660s, um, that, that they show a, a great obsession with precision. And that marks out his, his mathematics and indeed his science uh, thereafter. On Newton's return to Cambridge, he began refining his theories. Scientists have been investigating the properties of light for 2,000 years. They knew that light travels in straight lines and that we see objects because of light rays bouncing off them. The Roman mathematician Ptolemy had noticed that light bends when it enters glass or water. And as Newton took up residence again at Trinity, over in Italy, Galileo was busy working out the speed at which light reaches us from the sun. What made Newton different was that no one agreed with him. The theory that he's putting forward is so incredibly unusual. You know, he is saying that white light is composed of a number of primary coloured rays that are brought together. Everybody else says that colours are confused modifications of white light. Uh, everybody else uh, is wrong. I think you can see the tension between Newton's radically new thinking and the accepted science of the period in another of his diagrams. It's called the colour wheel and it appears in Book One of Optics. This is a first edition, and it dates back to 1704. But the ideas it contains were discovered some 30 years earlier. And here's the wheel. What Newton expected when he refracted white light through a prism is that it would come out looking like this, like a wheel. It's what most people thought at the time. The fact that Newton drew this diagram is somehow echoing that old thought. His spectrum has seven colours this time, unlike the five he had in the prisms diagram. Many experts think he was keen on seven because it would marry light to other harmonious features of the universe, such as the musical notes of an octave, which he marks next to each colour. The colours complement each other as you move around the wheel until eventually violet shades into red. It's a little bit like the idea of a musical scale. If I start on the note C, I end on a note which sounds remarkably like the note I started with, which we also call a C. Everything about this image really harks back to the idea of a divine order. So, if Newton had solved the mystery of light, what were the implications? Was it just a theoretical abstract breakthrough? Or were there practical uses? Well, in 1668, Newton turned his attention to trying to design a new telescope. He realised that the breakthroughs he'd made on light and glass could help him to solve a problem that had dogged astronomers across the world. The scientific revolution of the mid-1600s had depended on refracting telescopes, the kind Galileo used to survey the stars. But they had a problem with chromatic aberration. As light hit the lens, it refracted, creating a blur of colour. For Newton, light was the key to seeing into nature. An accurate telescope was essential. He decided to create a reflecting telescope with mirrors. Tucked away in his rooms here in Trinity, he ground the mirrors using a new alloy he'd invented. He'd made the case and the mount. The thing was scarcely six inches long, yet it had a magnification of 40 times its diameter. The equivalent refracting telescope at the time was some six feet long. Newton's grasp of refraction, so brilliantly captured in his diagram, was the key to achieving the perfect telescope. This is the Orion Optics Factory. The only company in Britain that produces top-class telescopes from scratch. Including the Europa 150 Newtonian Telescope, 
a direct descendant of what Newton made in the 1660s. Newton found that a well-made mirror at one end reflected a perfect image to a second mirror angled to face the eyepiece. People said that single-handedly he'd revolutionised the science of optics. He was well on his way to becoming the country's leading scientist and an acknowledged genius at 28. But Newton has had his critics as well. The poet John Keats felt that Newton had reduced the beauty of light to a mere event created by particles. A cold philosophy, he called it, that would unweave the rainbow. But there's an irony here. Artists have frequently used Newton's scientific diagram as the inspiration for art. It's hard to imagine, but there is a connection between Isaac Newton and Pink Floyd. In 1973, the prism was the key idea behind one of the most visually exciting album covers in the history of rock music. Dark Side of the Moon. The cover's designer was Storm Thorgerson. It was related to Pink Floyd's light show, and we were also responding to the keyboard player, the late Rick Wright, who said, let's not have one of your pictures, Storm. And he said, why not some cool graphic? <laughs> Newton was not in our minds particularly. I think I had originally seen a textbook drawing which is very straightforward, much like this, but only in black and white. I thought, well, that's quite nice. I mean, we're not scientists. It's the graphic rather than the science that makes it strong. And the triangle is part of that graphic. And I think that the graphic allows you to screw with it, allows you to mess around without, as it were, altering its integrity. Behind me here is the stained glass window, which I much prefer, which is also uh, cute, is that the word? Nifty, because it's rendered in something that is about light, namely glass. And its subject is about light, because it's the prism and spectrum. But it is very clearly dark side of the moon. If you get it when the sun's shining through it, it's beautiful. I recommend it to anybody who has a private chapel. So you think if you showed somebody that, they might think Pink Floyd before they thought Newton? I think they would definitely think Pink Floyd before Newton. I suspect Pink Floyd in this contemporary age are probably a little bit more, a little more well known. Pink Floyd's album cover makes it seem that there is in nature a band of distinctive colours. They appear as separated. Each has a name. But what are we actually seeing when we identify colour? Is the way the brain perceives light as important as the light itself? And is it entirely accurate to give colours different and separate names? Newton believed that the properties of light meant that each wavelength corresponded to an individual colour. But is that considered scientifically accurate today? I'm visiting Bo Lotto in North London. He's a scientist whose specialist study is the perception of colour. Colour doesn't, in fact, exist outside the brain. The brain makes it all up. Uh -huh. Colour is purely a function of the brain. Newton showed us that you can take white light and you can break that into different wavelengths. But I can take any one of those wavelengths and I can cause you to see it in lots of different ways. So here, what I want you to notice is that you have an outline drawing of two cubes. Yeah, yes. kind of uh, mega Rubik's cubes. Yeah. Sort of like. The one on the left has four grey tiles. Yeah. And the one on the right has seven 
grey tiles. Yeah. Okay. They're all the same greys. But are you saying you could mess with my mind to such an extent that I would call that actually a completely different colour? Yes. I'm not going to change the physical quality of those surfaces at all. Okay. Right. So tell me what happens to your perception when I reveal these two scenes. Whoa! Uh, it's changed to blue. And what you're seeing there now is the two scenes as if they're under different conditions of illumination, under different lights. The four blue tiles are all grey on the left. Okay. And Am they're I gonna all the here, same as the seven yellow tiles on <laughs> the right. They're all oh. grey. Oh, no. What Bo has done is to throw a differently coloured light over the cube, except where it's grey. That ambient light alters my perception of the grey tiles. That's your physical reality. Yeah. Right? All the things are physically grey, but that's your perceptual Whoa. reality. I would have said there were three different colours there, and you're saying there's really only one wavelength of colour. There's one wavelength, right? But I can get, that, I can get you to see that wavelength in lots of different colours. I mean, does this make some sort of nonsense then of what Newton was, you know, he argued about maybe the five, six, seven colours in the spectrum, but in some sense, does that not make any sense then? What he was really demonstrating is the physicality of light, right? Which was, of course, tremendously important. But what he wasn't talking about necessarily was the perception of light. So the reason why you see that as blue there is because in your past experience, a grey light coming under yellow light would in fact have meant a blue surface, just the laws of physics. So that's why you're seeing it as blue, because it would have been useful to see it that way. I'm kind of intrigued to see what colour my top's going to be tomorrow morning <laughs> after all this. Three hundred years after Newton drew his diagram to explain his theory of light to the world, it still reaches down through history and touches even a brand new science like cognitive behaviour. And by revealing the real properties of light and colour, Newton made it possible to develop fibre optics, laser technology and holography. It's these wider scientific and artistic consequences that confirm the enormity of what this great man did when he sketched out his crucial experiment on a scrap of notepaper. It's amazing to realize how much Newton understood about light from such simple experiments. He buys a prism in a country fair, sets up an experiment in his bedroom, and suddenly the mysteries of light are revealed. The genius of Newton is to look at nature through the prism of mathematics. Geometry, the lines and angles that he drew inside that diagram, are what gave him the insights into the mystery of light and colour. That diagram, the little hand-drawn sketch that he drew on a scrap of paper, not only revolutionised scientific thinking, it also gave us an unforgettable image of enduring beauty.